The uh, first, the first uh, item is a contested case hearings. Um, the roll. Okay. Uh, I guess we got to do that. Let's call Mr. the roll. Curran? Here. Commissioner Harper? Here. Commissioner Melitas? Here. Commissioner Revol? Here. Commissioner uh, Chair Rosenbaum? Here. Okay, now we'll go. Good morning, Chair Rosenbaum and Commissioners. I am Andy Chiller with AP&P, and I'm here to address the proposed final orders in the contested case proceedings against Donald Morse and Blue Elephant Holdings, LLC. As way of background, in March 2018, the staff instituted separate proceedings against Donald Morse as the holder of a worker permit and Blue Elephant Holdings, LLC, um, of a, a legal entity of which Donald Morse was a member, which held a recreational retail license and operated a store called the Human Collective Two. The charging documents allege that during an inspection of the Human Collective Two um, on March 1st, the inspectors um, asked about the store's inventory, which was showing in its metric account as still being on the premises. Mr. Morris responded by stating that he had thrown all of the inventory out in the dumpster behind the building, when in actuality he had taken it from the retail premises sometime in early July and moved it to the basement of his home. Uh, the inspectors during that inspection also discovered that all of the security footage for the store was deleted. Staff proposed to revoke Mr. Morse's worker permit and cancel Blue Elephant Holdings license, although because that license was transferred to another licensee in April 2018, that was later modified to a proposed letter of reprimand for the license entity. Specifically, staff alleged four violations against Blue Elephant Holdings LLC. First, that the licensee made intentional false statements to LLCC inspectors. Second, that they failed to have 90 days of security footage stored. Third, because Blue Elephant Holdings license had expired on December 31st, 2017, and they failed to file a renewal application until January 16th of 2018. Uh, we charge that licensee had improperly engaged in license activity after the expiration of its license by possessing marijuana items and transferring them from the license premises between December and January. And lastly, we allege that they failed to accurately account for their inventory and metric because it showed that it was still on the retail premises when in actuality it was in Mr. Morse's basement. Staff alleged two violations against Mr. Morris as a holder of the work as a holder of a marijuana worker permit. First, that he made intentional false statements to OLCC inspectors, and second, that he engaged in license activity after the expiration of the retail store's license when he, on behalf of his business, possessed the marijuana items and transferred those items from the store after that license had expired. The matters were consolidated in one hearing, which was conducted on September 10th in front of uh, Senior Administrative Law Judge Joe Allen in Tualatin. The commission called four witnesses, the two LLCC inspectors, Mandy Sandiford and John Marine. Uh, uh, they also called Merle Thomas, who was the licensee that uh, Blue Elephant Holdings was transferring its license to and selling its business to, who was present for the March 1st inspection and Ariel Haynes, who was the former store manager for the Human Collective too. Uh, Mr. Morse and Blue Elephant Holdings, who I will refer to collectively as appellants, because that's how they're referred to in the, the final order, um, they called three witnesses, Mr. Morse himself, his wife, Carolyn Morse, and Bradley Zussman, who is another OLCC licensee who appellants claim they had an agreement with to transfer the inventory, their inventory to prior to the expiration of the license. Um, on November 15th, ALJ Allen issued a proposed final order in the matter regarding Mr. Morse's worker permit. He found that Mr. Morse did in fact make intentional false statements to OLCC inspectors, that uh, there were no mitigating circumstances that would justify a downward departure from the proposed penalty of revocation, and accordingly that revocation of his worker permit was appropriate. He did, however, find that the commission's notice regarding the second charge violation that Mr. Morse engaged in license activity after the expiration of the license lacked the requisite specific specificity to constitute legally sufficient notice. The next day on November 16th, ALJ Allen issued a final order, a proposed final order for the matter against the license, against the former license. 
He found that the staff had satisfied its burden on all four charge violations and therefore that the letter of reprimand was appropriate. Both proposed final orders contained the uh, procedures for appeal and stated that any comments or exceptions to the proposed orders had to be filed 15 days after the service date. In addition, notice that these matters would be considered at this commission meeting was sent to the appellant's attorney on December 6th. Appellants did not submit any exceptions to the proposed final orders. Um, staff, however, submitted comments to both. Regarding again, the matter against the former license, we, the staff agreed with the ALJ's ultimate conclusions and simply requested a correction to a technical issue, the details of which are set out in our comments. And with regard to the matter against Mr. Morse's worker permit, uh, staff offered three comments to address technical issues and again, the details of which are in the comments which you have, and one comment to clarify the reasoning underlying one of the ALJ's conclusions. For that one non-technical issue, um, the staff alleged that Mr. Morse could have his worker permit revoked for improperly exercising license privileges on behalf of his business after the license had expired and before they filed a renewal. Appellants argued at hearing and again in their closing brief that Mr. Morse could not have his worker permit revoked on that basis because the text of the rule prohibiting that conduct referenced licensees, not permittees. Um, specifically, the language of the rule states that, quote, a licensee must not engage in any license activity after the license expires. It was staff's position that the rule setting out the circumstances under which a worker permit can be revoked was broad enough to encompass a violation of any of the rules, regardless of whether its language referred to licensees or permittees. Um, that rule, the subsection 1B of that rule simply states that the commission may suspend or revoke a permit when the worker has violated any of the commission's rules. And we believe that was particularly applicable in these circumstances where the permittee was also a licensee. Mr. Morris was a member of the licensed entity and therefore constituted a licensee. Um, in the proposed order, ALJ Allen noted that the appellants argued against the revocation of Mr. Morse's worker permit on this basis, but observed that it wasn't clear whether their objection was technical in nature, meaning that the commission's notice of violation lacked the required specificity in its citations to the rule it was relying on, and therefore failed to provide him adequate notice and was legally insufficient, or whether it was substantive, meaning that they were arguing that the commission actually could not revoke Mr. Morse's worker permit for a violation of the subsection of the rule that we, of the, the license renewal rule that we were relying on. The proposed order purports to address both the substantive <coughs> and technical objections, but as described more fully in our comments, it did not really engage in any substantive discussion or analysis of the non-technical objection. Um, on the other hand, the proposed order appears to mainly rely on the purported lack of notice to appellants and proceeded to discuss in much more detail the rule commission supported, the rule the commission cited in support of its contention that it had the authority to revoke Mr. Morse's worker permit. And the fact that it was cited generally in the commission's notice rather than citing the specific subsection we were relying on. Because there is another basis for the ALJ's conclusion that was addressed more fully in the proposed order, it makes any determination on that substantive question unnecessary. It's our position that due to the lack of analysis of its merits, refraining from referencing the substantive question when there is another more well-defined basis for the conclusion would create a much clearer final order and would prevent the possibility of confusion down the, down the road if the issue of the applicability of these rules in the context of the revocation of the worker permit comes up in the future. And I'd be happy to take any questions. That was a very nice presentation, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions at all? Um, I don't see Mr. Morris here today. Is he not present? Or? Uh, I, we don't think he was present. We also received notice around December 14th that his attorneys were wrapping up their representation of him. Um, so we didn't, we assumed that the attorneys would not be present and I don't think Mr. Morris is here. No. Okay. Thank you. I have a, Mr. three questions. Um, the first is um, the timeline in regards to handling all this. But before we get to that, what are you asking us as commissioners to, to rule on? Uh, is it one proposed order or two? Uh, there are two separate, so the, the we instituted two separate proceedings, uh, Commissioner Harper, but they were consolidated into one hearing. However, the ALJ issued two separate proposed orders, so we filed two separate comments 
um, and the comments regarding the matter on the former license, there's simple three or there's simply one factual error that we were seeking to correct. And for the for the worker permit order, we're seeking three, excuse me, four separate corrections, three to um, technical matters and factual corrections in the order, and one for the substantive issue that I just discussed. Okay, so we'll be voting on two separate things. That's now, correct. Now, getting to the the worker permit, uh, Mr. Morris went beyond what a normal licensee would do by getting a worker's permit. And so you're, you, sh you would like to extend the, the deletion or, uh, of his worker's permit because after what date that you said he took the, uh, the cannabis to his home? Or what date did he lose, lose his license and then his worker permit kicked in? Because you're right, this will affect future cases. Um, so Blue Elephant Holdings had a valid license until December 31st. Uh, Mr. Morris had a valid worker permit up until now. He still does um, until the issuance of this, until this order is finalized. Mr. Morris, as a licensee and permittee, we're alleging, took that the marijuana items from the retail store sometime around January 3rd or 4th. Um, and then Blue Elephant Holdings LLC filed a renewal application on January 16th and they were issued a CLA which allows them to resume operations on January 16th. So that, that's the timeline. So, hey Chair, but so Human Collective closed their business. What day did they close their business? They stopped operating their business on December 31st. Okay, so did we receive notice that they were closing their business and, and moving it to a new location? They were actually closing their business and not moving to a new location. They were actually ceasing their operations. And what had happened was that Mr. Morris made a business decision to operate his business until the very last day that their license expired. And then when that license expired, had nothing to do with that inventory that remained on the premises. So the reason he took it from the premises to his home is that he couldn't legally <coughs> have it on the premises anymore. He no longer had a valid license. And so he removed it to the premise from the premises and made an incorrect decision to store it in his house. So for, for, for my knowledge, when a cannabis operation closes their business, what do they do with the excess cannabis that they have prior to that date? It is their responsibility to address their inventory prior to the expiration date because the rules are very clear that as a holder of a license, you are not allowed to, and in fact, it is a, cr it is a crime to possess that marijuana after the expiration of your license. So it is their responsibility to get their fares in order knowing that that date is coming up and sell it or dispose of it um, or, you know, Mr. Morse could have on December 31st wasted the product under camera coverage and marked it a metric as destroyed. Uh, he could have arranged for the sale of the inventory sometime before December 31st, so he was not in a situation where he had this inventory after the expiration of his license. It was, it was on the licensee to make whatever business decision they need to make in order to stay, stay in compliance and deal with that inventory prior to the expiration of that license. Okay, and since and since the, he closed his business down, <coughs> and, and he made some statements to us here at the commission that stated he had destroyed <coughs> the the product. Mm -hmm. How how did we discover that the product was at was at his house? So the inspectors, so Mr. Morse's original statement to the inspectors was that he took all ninety seven items and threw it in an unsecured dumpster behind the, but, yeah. the retail business. And the inspectors found that to be implausible. So <coughs> they followed up with him and said, are, are you sure that's, that's what you did? And he stuck with that story. They actually saw him later on that day in an inspection for another location and asked him again and said, you know, it's, it's really, it, it strains our belief. It's, it's hard to believe that you would do this, that this is how you got rid of the product. Um, and he actually, after that first inspection at the retail location, Mr. Thomas, who is the licensee that he was selling his business to, um, after the inspectors left, Mr. Morris told 
Mr. Thomas that he actually didn't dispose of the marijuana items in the dumpster and that he took them to the house. And Mr. Thomas at that point was worried that that false statement would affect his ability to get the license. So Mr. Thomas actually told him, you need to either tell OLCC that you lied and that you have all this product or I'm gonna call and tell them. So because Mr. Thomas gave him that ultimatum, Mr. Morris eventually called Inspector Sandiford and, and confessed that the items were in his house. Did, did Mr. Thomas get the, get the license? Yes, that was who the license was transferred to in April 2018. Okay, and then um, final question um, in regards to the, the workers permit. I still am trying to grasp why we, why we would um, deny or, sus or, or delete his workers permit when he was a licensee and he didn't need to have a workers permit. So. I don't, I'm not aware that he didn't need to have a worker's permit, but the fact of the matter is that he did have one. And the, the sorry, um, commissioners for the record, Danica Hipsman, director of licensing. Um, it is actually a requirement that licensees also have a worker permit if they have any involvement in um, managing the flow of the marijuana in their business. So they actually do have to have one under our rules. Okay, and, and if, that's, if that's the case, <coughs> then in the future, when this thing comes up, Every, every licensee have a worker's permit and we will be ruling to deny them an opportunity to have and maintain a business or be in the cannabis industry after there is an infraction. Is, is that what I'm hearing? Commissioner Harper, um, because licensees have to have a worker permit and some of the same um, violations can be attached to the worker permit or and the license, um, that, that is correct, then, it, then in many cases, a proposed violation, if it is done by the licensee personally, will attach to their worker permit and their <coughs> license. And in particular, in this case, where you know at least part of the allegations is false statements, those were made by Mr. Morris himself. Um, that's why staff feel it's appropriate to pursue both the worker permit and the license. My, and my, Commissioner my Harper, just to clarify, that worker permit would not always be revoked. It's just if the violation was serious enough that would it would fall under a category one violation and would justify revocation. It is possible that there would be some other lesser sanction for that licensee and permittee, depending on the egregiousness of that conduct. But whereas here, the conduct was of such a level that it justified two category one violations, then the, the sanction would be revocation. Okay, so m my concern is that did, didn't Mr. Morris come from the Oregon Medical Association first and then he received um, um, our license to operate his business? Commissioner Harper, um, I'm not sure I know all the specifics of Mr. Morse's background, but he did have, he, he is from the medical industry based on, to our knowledge, yes. Okay. Right. Uh, say that, then I got, I got one quick question. Um, on March 1st, mm -hmm. on March 1st, 2018, uh, Mr. Morse, went with the two OLCC inspectors to go look at a growth site. His license was gone. His worker permit was still in effect. What did he need in order, let's assume that he would have been granted that growth site. I, I assume, he, what kind of license did he need for the growth site? A license, right? Uh, Chair Rosenbaum, yes, that is correct. Um, I, be I believe that Mr. Morse at the time had a couple of other applications in the process, and I believe that's what one of those inspections was for. And, um, and neither, at, at that point, according to the record, the two inspectors did not know of his, uh, his uh, deceit, if you will. Uh, Yes, Chair Rosenbaum, that is correct. Okay, but at that point, he he was going to have to have another license on the growth site. Uh, Chair Rosenbaum, yes, if he was going to, if if he was going to have a, um, if he was going to operate any licensed business, he would li need a license in that location. And he didn't have it at that point. Excuse me, uh, Chair Rosenbaum, if I may. Uh, I know it's not on the record. That's not my point. I'm asking a question for my own edification. That's all I want to know. If somebody knows it, that's fine. I know it's not part of the record over here. 
But it, this so is something that's a learning process for all of us. It, Chair Rosenbaum, yes, I understand. Uh, the only point that I want to make is that Mr. Morse is not here and doesn't have an opportunity I'm, to respond I to the information and, off know, the record. I'm, I'm at the point where I'm asking a question just for our own edification in the future. This is, I understand it's not part of the record, but this is a question I'd like to know, if I can. This okay. has nothing to do with the case at this point. I understand that. Chair Rosenbaum, would you mind repeating your question? The Morse had a, 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 a um, worker's permit. Yes, that's correct. Two OLC inspectors were going out to look at a grow site. At that point, in order to get, he had no license at that point. At that point on March 1st, he needed to have a license in order to get approved on the grow site. The worker's permit was not good enough. Chair Rosenbaum, um, in order to be able to grow marijuana at the location he was seeking a license for, he would need to be granted a license. I believe what was occurring was just simply it was a pre-licensing inspection. So it was just on another application that he had submitted and the inspectors were there doing a pre-licensing inspection. Right, and the inspectors had no idea of what was transpired back in December because at that point he hadn't, uh, he hadn't uh, confessed to the fact that he, he lied at that point. Um, Chair Rosenbaum, and I'm not as familiar with all the details of this as Ms. Chiller would be, um, so I, I don't know exactly what was in their mind. I believe, based on the record, that you know the inspectors at that point, because Mr. Morse had made statements to them that he threw it in a dumpster, um, had found that a little bit unbelievable, and so that was why they No, no, I, well, I read all the record. I understand that. Um, Can he get a license again in the future if we take this <coughs> action today? Is he eligible under the statute? May he reapply? I, I, that would be following up, uh, and uh, following up <laughs> to Commissioner Harper's question: Is this a revocation forever, or that's my may he reapply after a certain period of time? Um, Forgive me if that's an easy answer. Sure, Commissioner. So, um, if these final orders are adopted, um, this will establish Mr. Morse's uh, record of having a poor <coughs> record of compliance. Um, that will be a denial basis in the future <coughs> for um, future applications. Um, that is a uh, not a mandatory denial basis. It is one in which we would um, find that the basis applies and then go through our good cause analysis. Um, factors that we consider with our good cause analysis are things like passage of time, mm -hmm. the seriousness of the, um, the events that took place, um, and a number of other factors. So uh, at some point, there would be, you know, some of those factors would weigh in Mr. Morse's favor so that he would potentially have the opportunity to be licensable, but it's very case-specific. Um, um, and it would just need to depend on, you know, what factors um, are present if he does choose to apply again. A uh, quick one. All right, real fast. What what committees did Mr. Moore sit on prior to the prior to us uh, starting the cannabis uh, program here in the state of Oregon? Commissioner Harper, I believe that Mr. Morse sat on one of our original rules advisory committees back in 2015. I don't specifically remember if it was one for the um, producers or the retail, <coughs> um, but it was one of the subcommittees that advised the commission on the marijuana rules. The uh, commissioners will now go into chambers for deliberation on contested cases pursuant to ORS 192.690 sub 1. Once contested case deliberation. Okay, we have two motions. <coughs> Let's do uh, the license one first, please. Chair Rosenbaum. Commissioner. In the matter of the marijuana worker permit held by Donald Morris, I move to amend proposed order to make changes proposed by staff and to issue a final order revoking the permit. Clerk will take the roll. Commissioner Curran. Yes. Commissioner Harper? No. Commissioner Miletus? Yes. Commissioner Aval? Yes. Chair Rosenbaum? Yes. Motion passes. Next motion. In the matter of the marijuana retail li retailer license held by Blue Elephant Holdings LLC doing business as the Human Collective 2, I move to amend the proposed order to make a technical change proposed by staff and to issue a final order that imposes <coughs> a letter of reprimand. Clerk Mi will take the roll. <laughs> Commissioner Curran? Yes. Commissioner Harper? No. Commissioner Miletus? Yes. Commissioner Aval? Yes. Chair Rosenbaum? Yes. Uh, 
Our next uh, item on the calendar is compliance. Good morning and happy holidays. Chair Rosenbaum, members of the commission. I'm Michael Schein with APP and I would like to present for your ratification first four stipulated settlements of alcohol law violations as detailed in your packet. Chair Rosenbaum, members of the commission, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about any of these four stipulated alcohol settlements. Um, go ahead, Matt, uh, real briefly. Uh, uh, let's see. Barrel room, can you give a little bit of context? It sounds like it was their bartender who was intoxicated, and then uh, I, I guess just what's uh, – can you give a little background on that? Uh, yes, uh, Chair Rosenbaum, Commissioner Miletus. A uh, Portland police officer who uh, is actually a sergeant with the entertainment detail and very experienced encountered a highly intoxicated man in front of the barrel room around uh, 10 o'clock on the evening of January 13, 2018. He knew this man uh, to be a bartender at the premises he assumed that he could not possibly be on duty because of his intoxicated condition, and, uh, and that was essentially all the encounter at that point. Uh, he was called back to the same premises the next morning at 3 a.m. to help remove this man from the premises. Uh, the bartender was highly intoxicated still at that time and uh, causing a disturbance and uh, further investigation uh, both by the officer and our uh, liquor inspectors disclosed that he had in fact been on duty as a bartender at the premises from 8 p.m. Uh, that night <coughs> until he was relieved from duty at 1.41 a.m. due to his intoxicated condition. Uh, so staff charged a uh, a category two violation for having a uh, an employee who was intoxicated on duty. So he was, uh, initially they found him intoxicated at 10 p.m. and they did they just leave him? Or I guess I'm, I'm just unclear on, uh, the, the, the officer noticed he was intoxicated and then he was able to go back inside the establishment and, and conduct his, his shift or, or? That's correct. Uh, he, uh, because he saw him in front of the premises, not inside actually performing duties, the officer, as he noted in his report, assumed that he was not on duty at that time. Uh, but then subsequent investigation disclosed that he, he was in fact and had been on duty that night. Uh, and, uh, and so that was the situation. And was he the manager at the time or was he just a bartender? Uh, just a bartender. And it was the, the physical, visible signs of it was just visible. They didn't get a breathalyzer or anything like that. Uh, no, that's correct. There was no breathalyzer, but uh, the man was slurring his words. He was uh, making a lot of animated motions. He ended up uh, getting involved in several altercations, trying to dance with patrons, exhibiting many signs of intoxication. Okay, that clarifies it. Thank you. Any other questions? I need a motion, please. So moved. Commissioner Bozell. I move to ratify the four stipulated settlement agreements as proposed by staff. Mm. Commissioner Kern? Yes. Commissioner Harper? <coughs> Aye. Commissioner Miletus? Yes. Commissioner Raval? Yes. Chair Rosenbaum? Yes. Moving right along. Uh, second on our part of the agenda here for compliance. <coughs> Um, I would like to present for your ratification two stipulated settlements of marijuana law violations as detailed in your packets. Chair Rosenbaum, members of the commission, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about those stipulated marijuana settlements. Any uh, questions? I don't, I don't have any questions, but I, I just want to go on record, uh, and this is only my opinion. Uh, on the first case, on the positive vibrations, if this thing comes up again in the future um, and there's any, anywhere near the same factual situation, I'm gonna vote to, to cancel their license in the future. I just want you to know that. Um, I, it, 
it may be unfair to do it today, but I'm putting the staff on notice as far as I'm concerned that this type of thing needs a cancellation to send a message out there rather than a fine. Uh, I am very pleased that you did cancel the uh, Greenway Ventures uh, operation. If we don't send the message that we're concerned about this, we're going to be uh, not doing our job. That's all I want to say on it. Chair I need a motion. Chair Rosenbaum. I move to ratify the two stipulated statements as proposed by staff. Commissioner Kurt? Yes. Commissioner Harper? Yes. Commissioner Melitas? Yes. Commissioner Evall? Yes. Chair Rosenbaum? Yes. Bottle bill stipulation settlement agreement? <laughs> Good morning, Chair Rosenbaum. Good morning. For the record, I'm Becky Vogel with the Bottle Bill Program. I have two stipulated settlement agreements for bottle bill violations, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? I need a motion. Chair Rosenbaum. Commissioner Rosenbaum, <laughs> you're on a roll today. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I move to ratify the two stipulated settlements as proposed by staff. Commissioner Kern? Yes. Commissioner Harper? Aye. Commissioner Melitas? Yes. Commissioner Aval? Yes. Chair Rosenbaum? Yes. Thank you. Rules? <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. Chair Rosenbaum. Fellow commissioners, for the record, my name is Bryant Haley, Rules Coordinator for the Oregon Liquor Control Commission. Today I have two rules packages for you. One, the first rule we're going to go over today is OAR 845-025-9100, and this has to deal with uh, continuance of expiring hemp certificates. Industrial hemp certificates will begin to lapse during the mid-January 2019. This, would, this rule would temporarily prevent certificate holders from having the ability to transfer their products into the track recreational market, impacting 28 certificate holders with whom they hold a certificate with the commission. Those certificates were issued under the commission's prior authority for industrial <coughs> hemp, which was altered during the 2018 legislative session with the passage of House Bill 4089. The temporary rule will enable certificate holders to continue to operate while the commission completes its permanent rulemaking. The commission is set to complete permanent rulemaking for industrial hemp by the end of February 2019 and is holding a public hearing next month to deal with the issue. We should be before you in February with the final rule package on hemp. With that said, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Commissioner Rosenbaum. I want to thank staff for catching this and moving this forward. Uh, these are men and women who are, you know, have a, a great livelihood. And to have a, a bump in the road would have been quite costly for them. So thank you very much. Second that, yeah, absolutely. The, the hemp thing with the passage of the farm bill, we're going to see more and more of it. And I think we have to be <coughs> nimble and, and really thoughtful. And I've appreciated staff's discussions on it. And I uh, concur with what uh, Commissioner Raval said as well. Thank you, Commissioners. We are Thank trying you. to adapt to this new product as well in our market. Well, it's nice to receive a compliment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we try. Well, my father and mother always told me you get a compliment, you say thank you. <laughs> Maybe we do need to get better at that here. <laughs> Being a regulator, okay. it's not Chair it's not normal. Commissioner Roselle. I move to temporarily adopt OAR 845-025-9100. Of January 7, 2019 through April 30th, 2019. Commissioner Kern? Yes. Commissioner Harper? Yes. Commissioner Melitas? Yes. Commissioner Raval? Yes. Chair Rosenbaum? Yes. Thank you. Next up, we have the bill and technical package for 2018. This is an omnibus package. It is not fully, I want to make this noted on the record before I read in, that this is not all the rules within the package. We've had a kind of common misconception throughout the years of doing this, that this is all the rules within Division 25. This is focusing on the technical issues and uh, bill package issues that we've had to deal with over the summer. So for perspective, we started working on this package during in about May of this past year as the legislature had ended uh, right around then, and we began collecting technical issues on the backside of the packaging and labeling effort that we went through this past spring and summer. This package does both that. It implements the legislation of 1540, Senate Bill 1544, and in response to other issues that we've heard from the industry, and attempts to strike a balance between industry desires for more, uh, maybe less regulation, more lenient regulation and opportunities of privileges, while also uh, reining some things in that we as staff have discovered as problematic for the market. And it's been a difficult balance to hit both, but this is what we are attempting to do within the package. 
And I know that we've had some discussions with the commissioners here, and I was just going to go over some of the higher level issues to read into the record today. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt on any of the issues um, as I go through them. So with that said, I was going to go over these top eight issues that um, we had during the package. First up, um, OARA 251115 is denial of application. The proposed rule change creates a denial basis for licensees who fail to complete and re the renewal process as well as creates a denial basis for applicants found to have unauthorized interest. Those are two issues that have arisen and they were requests out of our technical area to uh, expedite licensing, um, help with renewals so that we can get through the backlog and really hold licensees accountable to being uh, part of the iterative process that is licensing. Licensing isn't always just to submit. It's, well, we need this, we need that, this is wrong. Uh, but when licensees fail to respond, they hold up other licensees. So that was the main issue of the driver here to the changes. Moving right along. Uh, next up is trade samples. This is something that the industry had requested uh, of us. Um, one of the larger problems with this rule was that wholesalers uh, want to show off all the wares from different licenses that they represent, that they sell through, that they find. So that limits, th they originally held to the limits of a single licensee. So a single licensee could show off the limits that we had in the rule of the product, but the problem was for wholesalers that they were limited to those same limits which really limited the catalog that they could go to retail shops and show off their wares. Um, <clears throat> next up is camera coverage. This was a large issue within the industry. We have certainly have heard from commissioners and attempted to be nimble on it. Uh, cameras are part of the three-legged stool we call of uh, regulation. Um, you know, if we, we can see something in metric as a data but point, but we don't know what the actual activity was. And that's where cameras come in and allow us to go back and check, well, what was happening? Um, so with this, we looked at the missing camera coverage issue pretty in depth, um, trying to strike a balance between, again, that regulatory need and also providing, um, you know, some relief to the industry um, on a category violation. So we bifurcated out the categories to allow for a 30-day 30, uh, 30 concept. If you have less than that, remaining a category one and above that would be a category two, uh, three violation, pardon me, for the first time. That's for a first time error we were trying to relax. If there was more with that than in a two year period, um, then we would still consider that a category viola category one violation. Um, the point of that two year period was to capture two grow cycles for outdoor producers. Um, it's a lot different on that area, so being all encompassing and holding licensees to equal footing would be the reason we did that. Well, you, but you're, this is just the beginning. I, I mean, we're looking at this much more detailed basis again. This is not the end of it. This is the beginning of it, right? Absolutely, Chair Rosenbaum. Uh, yesterday I held a phone call with a couple of licensees about some, you know, <laughs> desires, I call them, that they would like more with the market. Um, and, you know, I remind them, you know, being a former history teacher of where we started on some issues. And we started, um, as Commissioner Voloff and says, uh, were we too tight or were we too lenient? Um, and this is one where we're really discovering what is this, uh, available in the camera market from an IT perspective to licensees. What does that cost and what are our needs? Um, you know, so that we can get rid of the conjecture and we can really look at the issue of, well, this is, this is what it is. These are the numbers. These are what licensees are held to. So yes, we, we've, con we've had internal talks. We're getting uh, data together and we will get committees together on this in the near future. Okay. I'll say in the next year, not the near future. Uh, next up is OAR 845025-2040. This is production size limits. Um, this has been a difficult one for the commission to slay. Um, we've had uh, produce, originally we came with a size limitation, uh, 40,000 uh, square feet or you know whatever you apply for in your tier size. Um, and we had envisioned uh, one canopy. You know, this is where the marijuana is produced. That's not how um, it came out to be. Canopies were uh, separated out into, I think one farm had uh, submitted 400 canopies. Uh, this also becomes a staff time uh, suck, so to speak, uh, sink. And uh, so what we did last year was limit to 20 canopies. And we had worked with the industry last year uh, for this large bill package to reach that. Um, we then were still facing the uh, problem that staff calls the amoeba canopy, um, you know, canopies that are difficult to measure. Um, so what we did here is we clarified that the quaint canopies need to be quadrilateral in size and shape and as well as um, that if they can't meet that, another interesting idea the industry did come up with is use a professional land surveyor to provide us with documentation that they are within that square footage and the industry uh, did like that option. Uh, next up is the Immaculate Conception Rule, we call it. This is the startup inventory for producers. Um, you know, this is something that we've tried to uh, seed the market with, turn a phrase. 
um, to allow genetics into the market, allow uh, seeds and clones to be brought in without asking a question uh, within the first 90 days of licensure. Now that the market is up and running, um, we are trying to allow for our propagation endorsement holders, so nursery farmers, clone farmers, to uh, begin uh, being part of the market and seeding the market uh, is the for inventory. Um, you know, there's been requests from some in the industry to continue allowing it, um, but we have we've extended this opportunity to multiple uh, licensees and this will still be for applicants that had submitted before the pause that's the rule changes that we will allow people who are in before the licensing pause that submitted for that to bring in genetics next up is retail privileges and prohibitions probably one of our largest comments during this uh, rulemaking and largest issue was the medical limits that we uh, enacted we, we tried to strike a balance here between not being the only uh, not being the only source of medical and as well as allowing being a provider for patients being a, an avenue for patients to obtain uh, medicine um, you know there was a lot of comment on limits there were the comments on why do we have limits um, but I think that we struck a balance in the end of giving 32 ounces per day um, with that aggregate of a, of a monthly limit as well um, to try to um, you try to find balance in this continuing merging market of medical and recreational hey, uh, chair. go ahead uh, hey, uh, uh, Sure. Brian, I, I, I just noticed something. It has a time limit on when hours of operation. Is that pretty firm? They can only be open between 7 a.m. and 10 p.m.? Yeah, is, uh, because Chair I Rosenbaum, Commissioner late, Harper. Late night. Yeah, we, we, f we get this question every time that rule's open, and I kind of dread opening up that rule. It's, um, you know, it's a big question. Um, you know, we've had, we've had uh, licensees request later hours. We've had public safety resources request, you know, shorter hours. Again, this is one of the balances we have to strike. That was that issue is not within this rulemaking, but we have dealt with it multiple times in other rulemakings. Okay. Brian, will you again clarify the ounces and monthly average on medical? Because I think you misstated it. Oh, I, I think I did too. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's uh, eight ounces per, per okay. of usable marijuana per day, and no more than thirty-two ounces per month. Okay. Just for clarification, that was a big one. Okay. My uh, my misstep. Uh, the next step we have one is one go ahead. One quick thing, sure. um, in all the time I spent on this, the, the one issue that I was not happy with, <coughs> and I just want to bring it up, is that by statute you have to add language that to prohibit retailers from selling pet food, um, uh, selling pet food made from marijuana products. I think that's grossly unfair, and I think we should look at that in the future because why would we limit our own retailers when there's hundreds, if not thousands, of stores in this state are selling marijuana uh, products to uh, for dog use or pets or whatever you want to call it. So, I, I just make a note on that, please, because that I think we have to do it by statute. I don't think it's fair, and I think we should look at that. And Kelly, you and Danica, you already talked about that. I just want to go on the record on that one. So, Chair Rosenbaum, just to clarify some language there, as you said, marijuana products, those products you're referring to are CBD products, hemp products. It's, it's just a little different category, and those, those terms do have definitions that would matter. Because I was in New Season yesterday, and there was CBD products for sale, and they were advertising them, so I, I do understand what you said. And it is a, com a comment that we get uh, quite frequently, and we are working on this through the hemp package to discover, you know, what can we allow through our stores, what is human consumption, and what does the ODA allow us to work with because that comes down to kitchen and food processing. Um, so there, there's some levels of that that we will look into. Good enough. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, continuing medical issues is delivery of marijuana, uh, medical marijuana items. That's uh, 845025 28, um, What we wanted to do here was continue to address the medical issues um, and allow for interjurisdictional delivery by retailers who some choose to allow this option. We're again trying to find out what are the delivery interests out there, what are the medical interests out there to do this. Sure, Commissioner. Uh, I think that that was a good uh, balance. I, I know that was a little. There was some discussion on that. And frankly, I think with the for the medical community, increasing that limit and then also allowing for this option, if if the community decides to to take on this delivery, the most compelling argument I heard was people that were in far flung areas that only had a little bit of time to give to their community. This will provide them the option to have it delivered, which I thought was a really. Uh, elegant solution I think was, was good on your guys' part. I just want to put that on the record. I would give that to uh, Director Marks <laughs> as having the elegant solution. Uh, sure, we'll go. Yeah. One of the things is as long as they're not delivering how I used to deliver it, 
<laughs> in the parking lot. <laughs> 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 Just saying. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, next up of another issue that we, uh, we we heard comment upon and is something that the commissioners uh, weighed in upon uh, is the alternating proprietors rule. This is also known as shared kitchens. This is OAR 845-025-3255. Um, staff identified this early on in rulemaking uh, as a problem um, to, uh, during rulemaking I discovered my mind clarity on this was that this is the commission act essentially licensing time um, in the same premises, uh, so that means multiple uh, licensees, persons within the same premises. Uh, this ran into problems of uh, pickup and delivery from other licensees to other licensees that ran over other time schedules. Um, this is something that uh, we are proposing to sunset as a concept, not cancel anyone who's currently operating, but uh, not allow for change in ownership. There's only 20, 20 licenses involved in it, so. And, uh, and you'll notice on the dais there from in front of each of you, I put a, a small, uh, just a small correction. Uh, we had some duplicative language in the sunset clause there, and we just wanted to make sure it was clear. Um, so I did put that up in as a change today, and I did submit that in your uh, commission materials. <coughs> Uh, and finally, uh, is the waste rules. Uh, we we spent we spent some time on this one. Um, we had problems in with licensees diverting product by using waste, um, so we tightened up the rules to require um, s require camera cover camera coverage, and so that's also part of the camera coverage changes you'll notice in the 1410, 1430, 1450 rules. Um, and they need to document anything that is post harvest waste. That that's an important part here. We're we're not concerned about the fan leaf trim where producers are walking down the rows and plucking uh, mid-season growth. We're really worried about anything that's over 24 inches tall being wasted out as a whole plant or trim, uh, trimmed marijuana that has been wasted out. We want to know why and what's being done with it. So camera coverage as well as documentation is what we're putting in here. Um, and licensees had some good ideas on best practices for that that we're going to try to encourage in the future. And with all that said, I'd be happy to answer any further questions. Any questions? No questions to comment. I, I really want to commend you guys again. This was a uh, very challenging uh, rules package, and, and we all spoke a lot to the industry, and I realize we did not get to absolutely everything, and it, I mean, from, from our discussions, I know it'll be ongoing. Uh, I think you guys have, have done a great job striking a balance between uh, the bandwidth of the agency, the, the needs of the industry, and what we could get done initially, and what had to get addressed. Um, I think we got some of the more key issues, but but as you said before, it'll be ongoing, and uh, this will be a moving target. And I think uh, uh, if we <coughs> get to everything, it'll uh, it's an ongoing discussion. So thank you again for all your work, and uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll keep the ball moving. And to that end, Commissioner Merlin, I'd like to thank everyone in the staff and the crowd that really helped push this forward um, with some changes in the commission, personnel-wise, and so forth. This has been a, a heavy lift, and. Yes. We've committed since May to trying to get this right with legislative and technical issues. I mean, we do answer the phone. I answer the phone every time. If it's 4.30, 5 o'clock, I'm leaving, and I hear from a licensee, we'll, we'll consider the issue. And it isn't that, you know, some of these issues in here are uh, trying to append licensees' uh, abilities and privileges. It's more that we're trying to help the market mature. We're trying to keep it going as being that, uh, giving the privileges that are needed while also trimming the darker leaves, I suppose you could say. Well, Brian, uh, Kelly, Danica, JT, is he here? TJ. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. You did a fabulous job on this. You really did. In light of the personnel changes and everything else, uh, we're extremely happy. Uh, and, and I think the audience understands that this commission has spent a lot of time on this and with staff and reviewing it. I just want to go on record on one thing. Um, and I think it's very important, at least in my mind, is no matter how effective we create these rules and regulations for the benefit of the people in this state and for everybody else, we cannot do our job unless we have the adequate resources to get it done. Those adequate resources include a complete revision of our IT system to allow us to have this done. Now, you're sitting here with a commission. I'm going on record on this because I think it's very important. You're sitting here with a commission that understands that in order for us to make 
you more effective, either in liquor or marijuana in the future. We have to do our job to get this thing done. We're not getting it done right now. We're in a crisis mode, and anybody who understands or follows this agency understands that as well. No matter what we do with these rules and regulations or anything in the future, we're not going to be forming our functions correctly unless we get a change in this system. And it's not happening fast enough, uh, at least not for me. So that's on record. It's sitting on record. <coughs> I see a lot of heads shaking in this room. I second but, it. But <laughs> let me. I, I question it. Well, uh, let me assure you that we're not going to rest until we get this thing done. Thank you very much. Got both. Yeah. <laughs> we'll take the roll. You get a motion to amend. Who's got the. I got a motion. I don't need a motion, do I? <laughs> <laughs> No, we don't have a motion. Yeah. Do we? Yeah, yeah you do. It's on the back side of your yeah. motion yeah. agenda. Yeah. Oh, okay. I move. Mr. Chair. Go uh, ahead. Okay. Commission, yeah. this is your have a okay. okay. Okay, so final action. We have the, we did the industrial hemp cer certification, right? Yep. Right. Turn it over. Yeah, so we're working on uh, Division 25, 218 marijuana bill and technical packet. Suggested motion. <coughs> I took my glasses off so I can see. I move to amend OAR 845 Zero two five fourteen forty zero two five fourteen fifty zero two five two thousand zero two five twenty twenty zero two five twenty twenty five zero twenty five twenty forty zero two five twenty forty five zero two five twenty sixty zero two five twenty ninety zero two five twenty one hundred zero two five twenty one thirty zero two five twenty five fifty zero two five twenty eight hundred 025 Zero two five fifty five forty zero two five fifty ninety zero two five seven thousand zero two five seventy thirty zero two five seventy one sixty zero two five seventy five seventy zero two five seventy seven hundred zero two five seventy seven fifty zero two five eighty five twenty zero two five eighty five eighty zero two five eighty five ninety and adopt. <coughs> Eight four five zero two five eighty five seventy five effective December twenty eighth two thousand and eighteen. And I rest my case. <laughs> oh, that was the record, I think. <laughs> Commissioner Curran? <laughs> yes. Commissioner Harper? Yes. Commissioner Melitas? Yes. Commissioner Raval? Yes. Chair Rosenthal? <laughs> yes. Thank you much. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a happy holiday. Retail services. Hi, Nikki. Good morning, Chair Rosenbaum and Commissioners. For the record, I am Nikki Leslie, Purchasing Coordinator of the Purchasing Division. I am here today to present before the Commission a listing of activity for the month of September, October, and November. Under tab one, you find detailed list of activity. Um, staff recommend Commissioners confirm the 66 items on the list. And I'll be glad to answer any question. We had a busy three months. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? I need a commissioner. Yeah, please. Chair, 
Thank you, Commissioner. I move to confirm the 66 items for September, October, and November. Commissioner Curtin? Yes. Commissioner Harper? Yes. Commissioner Molinas? Yes. Commissioner Raval? Yes. Chair Rosenbaum? Yes. You have three minutes and that's it. Good morning. Morning. Wait for that to come up. Cool. I did not print all the papers this time since it's on the screen. Morning, Chair Rosenbaum, Commissioners. Good Happy morning. holidays. For the record, Brian Fleming, Director of Retail. Scott Larson, uh, Business Analyst, Retail Services. Okay, uh, this was sent earlier this week to you. Uh, my apologies, but in order to get the correct numbers accurate from last month, it does take a lot of doing, and we don't close our numbers, but you have it all here. Uh, this chart here, uh, state of uh, pop Oregon population per store, if you look in the far left, 248, if we'd have done nothing, uh, we would be one store per population of 16,900. Today, uh, we have authority to operate uh, 284 stores or in other words, we have one store per population of 14,700. Point to note, when we began expansion, we started at one store per 16,000 population. <coughs> this is a forecast, this goes out to 2025. Uh, again, if we stayed with the, uh, where we started, 248 store, we'd be at one store per population of 18,200. Uh, if we do nothing from this day forward, uh, in 2025, we will have one store for almost 16,000 population. So what this chart is trying to depict is we need to continue to evolve, make sure that we have, you know, uh, population growth uh, as a target and continue to add stores over the coming years. <coughs> this is the fifth phase uh, you just saw here a few weeks back. We've appointed... 42, six withdrawn, 25 have opened, uh, six are still in the various stages, and then the brand new stores that you approved uh, are in various stages of development. Uh, real quick, uh, two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, we did open the big store uh, in Beaverton on Cedar Hills Boulevard. I have actually personally visited. They did a great job. They have a little ways to go because they're trying to get open during the holidays to fill up the uh, other parts of the business, but uh, overall turned out fantastic. Brian, uh, is there a pattern on the six stores that have withdrawn? Uh, those were four uh, large four corporate grocers, oh, okay. uh, and then two okay. that uh, okay. uh, at that time Good because enough. of license conditions. Uh, lastly, uh, I don't know what the clock says, but if it's 10 o'clock, we're open our largest store in Oregon uh, in Central Bend, uh, Third Street Beverage, uh, and it opens this morning at 10 a.m. It has been a massive amount of work, uh, about 8,000 square feet. Gorgeous store. I encourage you to visit. Okay, so I'm going to just tap real quick through the uh, summary here. Uh, 38 million in phase one, 5.3 phase two, uh, 3.3 in phase three, 1.1 uh, phase four. Uh, that's because a lot of these are pretty small stores that came out of the phase four expansion. Next slide, I'm going to have Scott do. Yeah, so this uh, chart, we're looking at uh, historical sales for existing stores and expansion stores. <coughs> the top line on the chart, the blue line, looks at the 36 existing stores uh, that had an expansion store within nearby them. And then the green line on the bottom is the 25 open expansion stores. Um, you can see a slight arc to the existing <coughs> store line. And then the expansion store line has a nice steady upward growth trend. I think the takeaway from this chart is that the expansion store sales uh, more than offset the slight decline in existing stores. So this chart looks at the marketplace growth by each of the phases of retail expansion. Um, there's <coughs> uh, a lighter blue column uh, in each of these that represents the existing stores before an expansion store opened near them. The darker blue is the sales of those same stores after an expansion store opened, and then the green oh. is the expansion store sales stacked on top of them. So the difference between the lighter blue column and the darker blue is the estimated impact to existing store sales. The difference between the lighter blue column 
and the stacked blue Good and job. green is the estimated growth in that those marketplaces. So with phase one, we're estimating about 26% growth or 18.7 uh, in uh, net sales gains. Uh, I won't go through all the phases, but the total column to the right aggregates all these phases. Yeah. And so we're looking at about 20% uh, estimated growth, <coughs> and 25 million or so in net sales gains. Uh, and that's on top of the estimated 7.3 million uh, in uh, lost sales from existing sales. Next slide here. Uh, I don't think I'll take too much time in here. This is just uh, uh, showing you again what each individual phase is uh, and the impacts. Uh, so the dollars and impacts in each particular market. Uh, the next slide here is uh, an expansion of store sales uh, last 12 months. So just the new stores, $32 million. <coughs> For the marketplace, the stores closest to these stores estimated 7.2, 7.3 million down. Uh, if you subtract one from the other, 24 million is our estimate with uh, uh, 12 months of sales uh, gains. So just re reiterating the prior slide. And with that, since this is the summary, all the backup slides are behind me. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. One, can I get a, co a hard copy of this before I leave today? Uh, is that that's possible? Absolutely. All right, thank you. Yep. I, I, some of the other commissioners may want it if they have it. If you'd like one, just let me know, and we'll go back and print them off, and you can take them with you, or you can read the materials or keep the materials that you have, uh, but happy to give you a hard copy as well. And we anticipated people requesting it after the fact, so uh, we're happy to share. I just would have to print it out, so I'm asking you to. Yes, yes. <coughs> oh, Chair. Yes. I'd just like to thank all the, the operators and retailers and licensees for taking on this business. Um, this is still an excellent business opportunity, and it keeps us here in the state um, not only viable in, 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 in safe, safe sales and, and, and distribution to our citizens, but it also gives an, uh, us an exceptional opportunity for a marketplace of modernization. And um, more and more, we talk about the IT and the, the computer thing. I, I swear every person that came in front of us talked about their Yelp account or whatever the other terms they use to get this out. And I'm very proud <coughs> of what we have here at the commission in regards to getting out our numbers and sales. And if someone, a client is looking for a product, it's right there on our website. So thank you for keeping everything modern and up to date and some great, great operators that we've, we've appointed. So thank you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, just to wrap up, uh, we will be coming, Mr. Marks has given me, I think, three weeks breather or six weeks breather uh, with a form of expansion next year uh, as we get into marketplaces, isolate more to the target areas. Uh, but we'll come with that next year, and then we'll be back in six months to give you another update on well, expansion. This, uh, th this is excellent. And it gives you, it gives us justification for looking at continued expansion. However, I'm just saying from my point of view is what I'm going to be looking at very closely on any expansion is that those people, those retailers who put in time, effort, and money to get up and running and are doing everything they can especially if they're any place close to the new expansion areas where they've already, they're part of that new expansion. I'm gonna look very closely at whether or not you wanna put another store in any place there that's gonna compete with them if they're only in business for a year, or a year and a half to two years. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Chair Rosenbaum, one you passed and on <coughs> two phases ago. Uh, that store uh, in this area is actually growing at about 30% went off and finished all the investment they committed to, we decided not to add, and so that store's trajectory. So you actually made sound decisions which helped a new operator in an existing location, right. so absolutely. I think commi Commissioner needs you to. Oh, Chair, I was just going to say I agree with you, and I think that these numbers look so good because we did tap areas where there were not liquor stores, and we found areas where um, the population was wanting to have a little bit more access. Thank you so much. Thank you. Happy hour. We did go quickly. Okay. Um, in a minute, Bill, you're up. <coughs> Buy and share for us today. Uh. 
Commissioners, for the record, uh, Bill Schutte, Chief Financial Officer for the Liquor Control Commission. As soon as we get it up on the screens. <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> Wait for it. Uh, I've been asked to give you an overview of our uh, governor's recommended budget for the 2019-2021 uh, biennium. I'll try to go through it briefly. Um, there are a couple issues that may come to your attention. If you require more information, we can go into those in detail, either now or later, perhaps. But um, I'll just want to go and uh, provide, give you an overview of what the governor has recommended in their budget for the agency. Don't blow. I think it's up on their it's, monitor. It's on their individual it's screen. Is Andy. it on the? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll look over in this one. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know why. It's um, so the first thing the governor has recommended is uh, liquor licensing resources, which include two managers uh, for license investigation and processing, a limited duration position for processing special event licenses, and a position for public records request. Um, public records request is uh, the, the biggest um, burden on for the agency. It does come out of licensing, so they did provide a position for that. Um, in public safety, uh, two additional liquor regulatory specialists and additional um, equipment for statewide dispatch. I got on the wrong page. So mm -hmm. first thing they provided was distilled spirits program, uh, 10 warehouse staff with equipment, um, distilled spirits program manager with the uh, installation of the conveyor system, the new conveyor system. Uh, productivity has increased substantially out there. Uh, they're given us more resources to do that. Um, information technology investments, uh, they did provide 20. 2.5 million for the uh, privilege tax system, uh, beer and wine. Uh, that was required by statute that we go with an online beer and wine ta uh, tax system by the next uh, biennium. Um, we'll talk about what they did not provide us for information technology. They did provide us 1.1 million for um, statewide dispatch services to the Oregon State Police to help our public safety maintain uniform <coughs> communication throughout the state. Under liquor licensing resources, what I just went over before, that's on their, uh, their sheet now. Um, at the bottom of that, they did provide for us eight additional regulatory specialists for marijuana and one compliance specialist, three, for um, marijuana laboratories to be an expert in marijuana laboratories. So we have experts in labeling, we have experts in hemp, now we will have expert compliance specialists for marijuana laboratories. Um, more of an administrative note, they gave us some regulatory specialist reclassification money. Uh, the regulatory specialists for the commission were reclassified this biennium uh, to a higher salary, salary level based on a uh, human resource study uh, from DAS uh, itself, so we were given additional funds for that. Uh, financial services, one additional position related to liquor sales and liquor agent compensation. Additional liquor store auditor laptops, those are the people that go out to liquor stores and maintain the inventories are correct out there. Um, about 73,000 were recommended for uh, administration and communication to build out our internet. And, and one internal auditor was added by the governor, and that's part of, uh, you might have seen some of that in the press, um, for the agency itself. We currently have um, an internal audit program, but we use contract auditors, so the governor's recommended one internal auditor position for the uh, agency. Uh, the governor has also recommended moving the bank card costs, the credit card costs to agents, um, and in bal to balance that out to increase the agent's compensation from 8.93% to 9.94%. This is going to be a complicated maneuver, but right now the agency does pick up the <coughs> credit card costs for all liquor sales in the state. We want to move those to the agents and then compensate them accordingly. Um, this will probably occur in the middle of the biennium, which is why we only have half of that money in there, but uh, it's going to require quite a bit of effort working with Treasury, um, the liquor store agents themselves, and, and Department of Administrative Services. Uh, the governor has also recommended a doubling of the annual liquor license fees. And, and uh, substantially improve our IT system. We'll get to that. <laughs> 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 Uh, the governor has also recommended a doubling of our annual liquor license fees. Uh, this will require a statutory change, unlike marijuana license fees. Liquor license fees are in statute. Uh, they are some of the among the lowest in the country at this point, uh, but is expected to generate an additional 9.2 million in revenue. Um, 
And then the kind of surprise, this wasn't in the agency request budget, but the governor's budget has recommended an additional 5% increase in the markup formula for liquor. This is important for you because that markup formula is determined by the commission, has to be approved by the commission. The last time the markup formula was changed was back in 2009 when the 50 cent surcharge was added. Um, there is an expectation in the governor's budget to raise an additional 21.2 million for the general fund. Just quickly, what would be the price impact of a 5% markup? Uh, for a 12 bottle case, for example, uh, which are generally 750 milliliters or fifths, um, average bottle cost uh, price is 16.95. Uh, this is currently marked up with the current formula at 115% over the landed cost. A 5% increase would now price that bottle from at 17.80, or increase the markup 126%, um, or to 126%. Percent. A six bottle case, which is generally half gallons or 1.75 liters. Uh, current average is about 26.95 per bottle. Currently marked up at about 119% on average over the landed cost. A 5% increase in this will price the bottle at 28.30 or about 130% markup. So it is a substantial increase. So getting to Chair Rosenbaum's point, what was not recommended in the governor's budget, uh, we had requested significant uh, information technology investments for physicians, about 5.5 million uh, to address things like warehouse management systems, licensing systems, uh, financial systems, basically replacing 20-year-old technology that we continue to struggle with. That was not provided in the governor's recommended budget, um, but just as an aside, most other agencies did not also get information technology investments. One quick question, the three, uh, three OS2 positions in new classes, are those the camera positions? Uh, no, they are not the camera but positions. The I'll cameras? get to those, yeah. Oh, you get to those, yeah. okay. Uh, and they did not provide us the OS2 positions uh, for reclasses, which are uh, generally in um, uh, licensing service permits. Um, they did not provide marijuana program enhancements, including the video watchers. Those are the, the camera positions, uh, the camera analysts, uh, and reclasses and outreach funding for that as well. Uh, they think we think they may have come up some short well, I mentioned they did give us some money for the regulatory specialist reclassification There is a difference in opinion between the agency and the <coughs> DAS of how much that's going to be We will not know exactly what it be is until the personnel systems roll over into the next biennium um, But we think they may be short on that, but we will address that at the time when it does roll over uh, they did not give us any we had requested accounting technicians for distillery agents that was not provided in the budget uh, position for the bottle bill was not provided in the budget and um, in administration communication outreach funding internet staff and a senior policy advisor was also not provided in the budget uh, in our agency request we had requested uh, 6.2 million for the roof replacement of the main warehouse that was significant uh, that roof replacement also includes seismic remediation that's a large part of that cost um, not provided in the governor's budget at this time, continue to discuss. Um, we also had recommended some increase in agents compensation, proposed to equalize the compensations paid for licensing and consumer sales, not recommended in the governor's budget, and to increase the compensation for distillery agents um, as part of a um, effort to help some of the smaller <coughs> distillers in the state with, uh, with a little more money. Um, currently they are compensated like liquor agents they are part of the liquor agent formula. We would break them out of that formula and create a new compensation system for is, them. Is that's assuming, both of these are assuming that you're going to break out the distillery agents because obviously they're, they're connected. So you're going to break out the distillery agents, have that be separate, and increase whatever revenue increase would be, they'll only hit the agent compensation and it would be separate from the distillery. Yeah, Chair Rosenbaum, that's and correct. Where would yes. we stand on that? On, in terms of the concept of separate them, we think it's a good idea. There's reasons to have them separate and discrete, and the retail agent's uh, compensation is a little bit different than the well, service. I, oh. I know all that, but yeah. my question is, is is where we stand on it. I, I mean, is there a proposed legislation, or we're just discussing it now? 
uh, we were discussing the governor's decisions relative to our budget. So we had asked for slight increases in both compensation right. and then both new plots. We were not granted any. No. Well, my point is that yeah. if you do it, yeah. you have to you have to consider both of them, yeah. obviously, yeah. because okay. And it's our it's our intention uh, to manage two plots into the future, regardless mm -hmm. of yeah. new funding. Thank you. And then quickly, to just a summary of the uh, governor's recommended budget. It was a very good budget for the agency. There were no recommendations for any cuts to the agency at all. Um, the total recommendation of 28 new positions with the agency of the 10.4 million over what they call our current service level, which is basically what we spend now plus adjusted for inflation. So um, we increased staff, current staff positions from 326 to 354, or 8%. Um, overall, the current service level budget increased from 226.7 million to 245 million or 8%, but that also includes additional expense related to the markup formula uh, increase, which is for agents' comp and credit cards. So, and with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, no, one more slide. Uh, next steps for the budget. <laughs> uh, sorry, Commissioner Buell. Uh Next steps for the budget, we are kind of in the middle of this. Uh, consideration for this budget, we take the governor's budget to the legislature of ways and means. There'll be about three hearings between January and June of 2019 while they hear our budget and, and make final adoption. Um, hopefully final adoption by legislature towards the end of the session, signature by the governor after adoption, adoption by legislature in about July or August of 2019. And with that, I'll close. Questions, please. Can I have a hard copy of this, please? Yes. Any other Excuse commission me. wants a hard copy? Or? Okay. All right. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Steve, you want to say anything? Sure. Or everything? <laughs> or? Uh, just uh, a little bit here. You know, this is the beginning of the budget process. Obviously, the governor has recommendations. We reflect the governor's positions, but many of these pieces are in play in legislation that will affect the outcome of our budget. And certainly, and the chairman and I have met with the governor's office on the technology issues. We're still working those forward. We actually have, I think, considerable support to move forward during the session to seek the funding that we need uh, to make that happen. I am very intently focused on that. Uh, it's a slow process. Uh, I want to reflect how proud I am of our IT team who has got all of our materials for StageGate 2 into the process. It's ready. Uh, we're just awaiting the CIO's office evaluation. We expect them to have that back at the beginning of the year. And that will give us the opportunity to launch forward from there and have a chance to secure the funding uh, that we need for IT projects. It's a difficult process. Um, and uh, But it, as the chairman said, it's essential. Some of the things in legislation that are coming around, flexibility of our system <coughs> with agents, they have concepts that Senator Byer is very interested in, are dependent upon us having new technology in place to be able to implement those ideas for our uh, business operations on the liquor side. Um, and certainly on the marijuana side, you know, we know we have critical problems with licensing and that relicensure issue is quite frankly killing our staff, which is part of the reason those licensing positions we were denying the governor's budget remain important to us. Small part of the help that we need to continue to do the processing of the flow, I'd say, on legislative issues. Well, and then you have, of course, the markup. Uh, it's a process of going through the budget. We obviously are revenues to balance the governor's budget. Um, and I'm sure there's uh, going to be continued discussion with the legislature about what the right mix of those revenues are to balance the budget in the end. Um, so um, uh, I'm confident the governor and the governor's staff will give us a high side if <coughs> that action and when that action is needed and when they'd like to see it made by the commission uh, if they want us to proceed forward. But it's certainly been proposed. Commissioners are going to hear a lot from the manufacturers community uh, about how dissatisfied they are with that. Um, and uh, make a case that, you know, we're amongst the highest in the nation in terms of markup already. Um, so um, 
be prepared. You will hear from them undoubtedly. Um, and then on the, on the legislative front, um, I think really uh, there is considerable support for doing something additional for the distillery agents in terms of compensation. Um, and uh, there's a, a larger policy issue where we're, uh, Senator Byer is interested in discussing more about reordering sort of our business with our, our retailers and how we operate. And I think it offers potentially some opportunity for us, but um, it's certainly not maybe the proposal that you've seen earlier that the agent circulated that was um, a lot of price flexibility and compensation going to their side of the equation. So I think we're looking at a more balanced uh, approach there if the legislature moves uh, forward with that. That's a lot of hard sledding on that one. I think it's too big of a chunk to take on in any one time. So if you did it, you'd probably authorize um, actions over over time to move forward with a, a more flexible and independent retail operation. Any comments? Steve, thank you very much. I, and thank the whole staff. You're operating under very difficult circumstances and I think we all know that the, the <coughs> Vice President of the United States never gets recognition and the Deputy Director of this agency never gets recognition that he deserves and will. I just want to take this time to thank you as well. It's um, the whole staff is very professional. I'm, I'm saying that because I believe it and thank you. With that, have a happy holiday. <laughs> See you next year.